Welcome to Talking Live. I'm Dr. Ravi Ludwig, and we are working today in collaboration with Preferred Health Magazine. And I could not be more thrilled to introduce you to a pioneer in the scientific community, Dr. Patricia Broderick. She's here to join us to tell us about the exciting new work that she's been up to lately. And we are thrilled to have her here today. We had a few tech glitches, but here we are. Here we are. Dr. Ludwig, what a pleasure it is to meet you. Uh, it is just, it's a pleasure. The pleasure is truly all on my end. I, I was fortunate enough to talk to you before this interview. And just to go back a little bit, we spoke a little bit about your history and inspiration. And we go back to when you were a young child yes. and a tragic Christmas day that set in motion this search for meaning and science. Can we hear a little bit about your father who has inspired you to name this probe that we're about to talk about? Oh my goodness, what a wonderful way to start. You know, as a psychotherapist, you know what happens at the ages between six and seven years old how absolutely critical they are for us to build certain memories, to build certain learning possibilities, probabilities, the neurons to bond, to build all kinds of hydrogen bonds and covalent bonds. Our brains are so plastic. They are making new neurons all the time. You know, you have heard in the past, so has everybody else, that we do not make new neurons. We most certainly do. Now, at the ages of six or seven, we know that that age, you have a beautiful daughter, uh, and I have beautiful nieces and nephews, um, and I have not given up my life for a career. That is not why I don't have children. I actually do not have children because I have given my life to God as a Dominican sister of Spark Hill, New York, the Order of St. Dominic. Now, at the ages of six and seven, and I didn't tell that to anybody else but you, Dr. Robbie Ludwig, so you must be a very good psychotherapist. You just got that out of me. <laughs> and so let's go back to those ages of six and seven when we form those are the forming years so had my father been killed when i was three years old it would not have had the effect it had mm. as i was six turning seven okay there were certain neurons form when that phone rang at two o'clock in the morning on during the night of christmas eve into the morning of christmas day because my father uh, you notice I say my father, uh, I don't say my father. We never said mom and dad. We didn't say those things. I'm first generation Irish American. So that makes me extremely European. Mm. I have many European ways, you know, when I meet somebody, I'm going to give them a hug. I'm going to give them a kiss. I professionally, I'm going to put my hand out to shake the person's hand immediately. Uh, um, that night, the morning of that night, my father gave us each a kiss on the cheek. You know, he was a man of very few words. Okay. Uh, I'm looking up at the camera because that has been my direction, but I want to look at you desperately, may I? Because looking You may, you may. Looking up at the camera, I cannot look in your beautiful eyes, so I'm going <laughs> to look over here, and does that suit the filming okay? I'll just cross my legs, okay, and get more comfortable. So, he, you know, he was a man of few words. Uh, the time that I had with him, was glorious. It was totally and absolutely glorious. So I don't feel as if I missed anything, to tell you the truth. He resides in each of each and every neuron of mine every single day of my life. He has never left me. So 
uh, he gave me my, a kiss on the cheek and he said, by now, in his Irish bog, he said to my sister Julie, by now, with a kiss on the cheek, by now to my mother. Um, and he said, I'll be home soon. Save this dog for me. So that was the order he was given to us, that the star does not go on the tree. When he comes home, the star will go on the tree. Okay. You write in one article where you were interviewed that you got your love of dance from your father and your love of prayer from your mother. And one thing is very clear when we read articles about you is how close you are to family and you decided to dedicate the name of this futuristic probe, which you have created and I want to hear more about it, called yes. it the Broderick Probe after your father and the Broderick Foundation is named after your aunt who gave you her savings as a nanny to help start this foundation. Yes, she did. Yeah. Yeah, she did. Um, that's Aunt Lillian. Yes. Uh, every, I, my father is one of 11 and my mother one of 14. So um, uh, first generation Irish American with 60 first cousins right off the bat. <laughs> grew up on a farm. My father grew up in a thatched cottage and immediate county Clare. And he walked to County Galway for his first job. Um, you can see that I'm extremely, extremely Irish American with uh, the Irish dancing and the medals and the, except that I did classical music, Beethoven, Bach, uh, all of that. My father just could not uh, give us enough. Um, I'll give you an example of my, the quality of the six years that I had um, one Easter, you know, most children get chocolate uh, bunnies and stuff for Easter. And uh, he brought home two real Easter rabbits. Mm, wow. Here we have my love of animals. Uh, here we have my desire to save animals. I want to do, I want to do live and I'm doing it. I'm doing, I'm studying the human brain live. I am studying the human brain live. I am studying. Let, let, let's get into that, brain. Dr. Broderick, because I, I want to mention to everyone that you are really a multidimensional person. You, back in the day at one point, wanted to be an actress. So now you're a scientist in front of the camera doing really incredible work. I don't know if you're familiar with the Black Mirror. Are you familiar with that TV program? It was on Netflix. Tell me about it. Well, the Black Mirror talked about futuristic things that would happen with technology. And one uh, episode talked about putting a probe in a person's brain. And when I read about your work, and of course we're talking about the Broderick probe, uh -huh. uh, it made me think about just what the future holds in terms of science. I'd like you to tell the audience what the Broderick probe is and oh. what it does. Okay, I'll need to get um, that's one. Okay, we can. It's smaller than a human hair, and I'm going to show it to you right now. And I'm going to show you one that's already been in the epilepsy patient, which is uh, absolutely wonderful because none of this has been ever done before. And I'm happy to say it's going to be done all over the world now. Um, may I ask somebody, my beautiful assistants here, to give yes. us probes and stuff like that? Well, until until we get the probes. Let's talk about what the probes actually do and what got you to even think about this? What got me to even think about that is I was thinking about carbon. I was thinking about how we're made of carbon. Mm. Thinking about phones, uh, not so much the satellite phones, but what we started out with, the Bell telephone, and that's carbon. And so that's, that's conducting 
electricity. So if that's conducting electricity, then it, we, we have to be conducting electricity in our brains all the time. Our brains, spinal cord, our bodies, all the neurons, the, we are electric. If we were not electric, we would not be killed by lightning. We are electrical beings. We are chemical beings. That does mm. not deny the existence of the divine providence at all. We are chemical, we are electrical, and we behave the way we do because of the things that have happened to us and because of the genes that we have. And whatever genes that we have, we have molded, we have plasticized these neurons, we have whatever we do, whoever we meet, now meeting you, Dr. Ravi Ludwig now will change my life again. Uh, I hope for the better. I hope it's not a traumatic experience. It is for the better. Uh, this is made of carbon. It's smaller than a human hair. It does not produce gliosis, which is scarring. Mm -hmm. you know, scars. And, it, uh, and that's according to the pathologists in NYU. Does it go in the brain? Does it actually go in the brain? Now, there are two series of, of the probe. More that, well, there are thousands of formulas. And the trademark is the Broderick probe. I wanted it to be called the Bro Patrick Broderick probe, but my trademark attorney, Scott Greenberg, who's a doll, I meet, I, this is what I love about being in this business and is all of the beautiful people that I meet all through my mm, yes. so unusual. And how in God's name did I ever get to be the actress that I wanted to be from the very beginning, even though I entered the convent, which I did not want to enter, of course, because I was on the verge of getting married. And so yes. it was a big fight between me and God going on there. Okay, but he won, he always wins. You know, your husband wins too. They all win. <laughs> well, it, I guess at least you're married to somebody perfect, truly perfect. Oh, <laughs> that's <laughs> wonderful. Okay, so now this is made, think about carbon. And it's just carbon are just molecules. Now, they can be made into nanotubes. Uh, they can make, be made into diamond, mm. and diamond doesn't conduct as well as uh, carbon does. Um, so tell me what this does for the layperson. Uh, okay. Somebody has a, a Broderick probe put in their brain. Right. Is it a diagnostic tool? Is it a curative tool? What are the ways in which it can be used? It's diagnostic and it's also curative, okay? Okay. There are so many different formulas. Like if you have, you get, okay, think about, oh, hey, um, I just, I rarely wear makeup. Uh, and today I have a little bit of makeup on. Uh, but even just think about moisturizer, okay? I have in my pro, a process, uh, I didn't even publish this yet. I patented it, but I didn't publish it. My next publication is going to be on the, the, the beauty of the Broderick probe, the beauty of the Broderick probe, because I have all of these fatty acids in there, unsaturated and saturated fatty acids, which are in our moisturizers. Mm. Okay. Um, and they are uh, anti-agents, aging agents, okay? Their beauty, so I'm writing chapter six of the book. The whole book is finished. It's chap 17 chapters, monograph. No scientist ever writes a monograph. So let me just say, let me just say the name of the book because we want to get the cover out there. And I just corrected the name of the book is called, this is by Dr. Patricia Broderick. It is not out yet, but you can, pre-order it right now. It's called Neuroimaging Sensing Biochemistry of the Brain. And really, this is the essence of the Broderick probe, which initially, I believe, was to help patients with epilepsy, correct? Yes. Uh, 
patients with epilepsy are uh, refractory to receiving medications. The medications just don't work. Mm -hmm. And the surgeries work in over 90% of the patients. Um, the, what happens is the neurons are firing too much. You're showing us the probe right now? I am. Okay. Oh, now I'm in, now can you see my full face? I can, you look beautiful. I'm thinking you must be the most glamorous nun ever. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and here's the difference. I just want to say something funny because yeah. I just want to say something funny. So yeah. I'm reading what your probe is made out of last night and I'm reading that it's made out of carbon. Yes. And it's so funny. The first thing that comes to my mind is, oh, the same thing that diamonds are made out of. And you're thinking it's the same thing that we're all made out of. So the difference between my brain and your brain was just very clear at that moment. Wow. <laughs> That's beautiful. And we can use a gold uh, probe too, you know. Oh. You know what's interesting? The more holes that are in the gold, you would think they were imperfections, and they are imperfections. But the more imperfections that you have in your gold ring will bring you better conduction for the brain and will bring out the neurotransmitters even better. Now, I want to just tell you about the probe and how it can bring you beauty products. Okay, I can take what moisturizer you have right now on your face by any mm -hmm. you have moisturizer on i do okay and i do okay now i have in my patents that those moisturizers and i can see the dopamine that dopamine that makes us feel good the dopamine mm -hmm. reward it makes us feel good serotonin is in antidepressants agents it makes us feel good even if we're not depressed when we have increased serotonin, we feel good. Serotonin is great for sex, for food, uh, for sleep. Okay, do you get any better? You don't get any better. Than you can't get any better than that. Now, I, my probe can actually pick up dopamine. Dopamine adheres to the probe. Oh. Yes, yeah, so that means the brain is getting more dopamine and more serotonin just by the probe being in the brain itself or being in the spinal cord or being in any neuron in your body. Now, would that help somebody who is, let's say, profoundly depressed or even suicidally depressed? I know when we spoke to Dr. Broderick, you said the problem with the suicidal brain is they no longer are able to, to feel anything in the reward center of the brain. So could your probe help with something like that moving into the future? Yes, it can. Because you see, we can see a profile of the neurotransmitters. And, the, and when we see what is in the brain, we can see how the patient feels. For example, we're the first to see inside the epilepsy brain. Uh, we don't see dopamine or serotonin in there. At the very early stages where there's no, no degeneration taking place, you can see some. But as the neurons die, you don't see any more. Uh, but what you see all of a sudden is uh, compounds like peptides. Um, and so, so when we're looking at the future of this probe, uh, one of the ways it was described is this can really open up personalized medicine for people. Yes. And I know that there was a diagram where you showed a readout, almost like an EKG, where you could see yes. what the probe was telling us. Yes. Yes. We can see the readout online instantaneously right before our eyes. Now the old kind of science. This changes Dr. Kolodny, who is a brilliant man. Edwin Kolodny, uh, he's a, retired in Massachusetts now. He is, people have come all over the world to be diagnosed by him. And he was 
I had the pl pleasure of working with him. I had the pleasure of working with the most fabulous people, like Arvid Paulson, who got the Nobel Prize, like Peter Lederer, who should have the Nobel Prize, actually. <laughs> um, and you see, we can see things that other people cannot see. Mm. So we're looking at the epilepsy brain and we can see there's different molecules in there than the normal brain. Right away, we can make a drug that has those molecules in it. Or we can take one of the millions of the, form I have millions of formulas, millions. And we can take one of those, like one is for an unsaturated fatty acid called oleic acid. And oleic acid is used for stroke. And actually, we've done stroke studies where also where we see the no another thing we can do that nobody else can do. We can see the normal brain before it has stroke. Okay, then, and then it has stroke. And then we see the stroke signals and we can see what we need to bring down. At the same time, we're looking at the, the, blood, the blood clots at the same time. And we're giving anoxaparin, which takes out the blood clots. And when the blood clots are being taken out, then the neurotransmitters are changing. And then we can see the neurons in the brain that were about, that were uh, dead or about to die, come back to life. So it's almost like a rebooting of the brain in some cases, it sounds like. Yeah. That's what it is. It's a rebooting. It's an electric, you're, you're putting an electric potential step in there. Now, what's that? It's energy. That's right. what so you're taking the, this beautiful little sexy thing here, smaller than a human hair. This, it's in here. So think about the MRI, the PET scan and all of that. Are they good? Yes, they are good. Have they done a good job? Yes, they are good. Can we use this with those technologies? Yes, they can. Yes, we can, because this will help those. But the difference between this, which, um, which you, I'm going to take another one out. This has been in the patient already. So this has been gamma irradiated. So you never have to worry about that. Did you know your milk is gamma irradiated? No, right? So yeah. there, it just sounds like there are just multiple ways in which this could be used in terms of the future of uh, dementia and Alzheimer's and epilepsy and mental illness. And I just want to thank you so much for joining us today. I know we got a late start, and I want to tell our audience that you also have a weekly radio show called Easy Sense, where people can hear your latest research and your guests, and you talk about the COVID brain and just all the latest research that you're doing. Please stay in touch with us and, and let us know everything that's going on so we can have you back. Oh, please do that. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh. And thank you to our audience for joining us on Talking Live, and we will see you next week. And the pleasure is all mine.